Welcome to today's Conversations in Color. We're thankful to the ITA group for their investment in this speaker series and their understanding of the need to not only create the space to engage in this important dialogue, but to bravely and intentionally create a new and different narrative aimed at creating an inclusive and more equitable Des Moines. I'd also like to thank the Greater Des Moines Partnership for co-hosting this speaker series. To help us explore the questions of race and equity in the workplace, we have invited Johnny C. Taylor, President and CEO of SHRM, the Society for Human Resource Management. A Drake Law School graduate, Mr. Taylor hails from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. His career spans over 20 years as a lawyer, human resources executive, and CEO for both the nonprofit and for-profit organizations and corporations. Prior to joining SHRM, Mr. Taylor was president and chief executive officer of the Third Good Marshall College Fund. I am thrilled to be able to welcome back to Des Moines, Johnny C. Taylor for today's conversation in color. Before moving to our pre-recorded conversation with Mr. Taylor, please enjoy this short video. Thanks for joining us. These are the hands of our nation proud, diverse. These are the hands that taught our children, raised our leaders, fought for freedoms, defended our country, and that today contribute to the most productive, inventive, and industrious workforce in the world. These same hands push the bounds of acceptance, tear down the barriers of resistance, hold us up when we need it, point out injustice when we see it, come together in union, and stay together in unity. These hands can build a nation of inclusion, a workforce that is as diverse as the hands that built it, that empowers our teams, lifts up our communities, rewrites our future to understand what one nation really means. It takes many hands to build a world of work that works for all. And now more than ever, we need a show of hands to move forward together. Johnny, it's a thrill to welcome you back to Des Moines. And yes, uh, we yes. know that you have roots here in ways that not everyone knows. But if you'd like to share with us a little bit about your Des Moines roots, but then beyond that, I would love for us to start today's conversation just discussing the work of SHRM, the work that you're leading. Not only the depth of that work, uh, but its relevance both today and then beyond. So it's on you and welcome. Well, I'm so glad to be here. And while you say you're not a professional interviewer, what a great introduction. Thank you so much for welcoming me, me back home. As you know, I mentioned Des Moines, my second home. I'm born and raised in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and did my undergraduate work at the University of Miami. So I literally had ever lived anywhere else in my life other than Florida until I moved to Des Moines. So Des Moines is the second place I've called home in my life. And I came there to attend Drake University's law school, had a wonderful time. All of my friends kind of laugh and say, how does a black guy from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, South Florida, very diverse population, how did you A, end up in Des Moines? Better yet, how did you enjoy Des Moines? Well, I had a wonderful time in Polk County. I loved the people and, and a very vibrant place to live. And so I'm a big, I'm sort of your unofficial Chamber of Commerce guy, the spokesperson for Des Moines, had a wonderful time and uh, now live in Washington, D.C., where I head an organization called SHRM, and that's the acronym for the Society for Human Resource Management. We are the world's largest uh, professional association of human resources. Uh, members around the globe, 165 countries. We have 300 and some, 305 or so, 7,000 members right now across the globe. And the work that we do is really focused on elevating HR. And when I say that, it is elevating the HR profession, uh, which is, you know, frankly, one of those things where people don't wake up one day and say, I want to be an HR professional. They say, I want to be a doctor, a lawyer, right? Those sorts of things, but you don't think of being an HR professional. So elevating them, elevating the profession, and then elevating the HR professional. And that's all about equipping them with the skills that they need to practice real high quality HR. And that impacts all of us every day because uh, other than being a trust fund baby, most of us have to go to work somewhere to earn a living. And so HR directly impacts you and your family, compensation, benefits, et cetera. 
So we do that work. How do we elevate the HR professional? And then thirdly, which means we are relevant to everyone, is we elevate HR. That means human beings. Organizations make money and exist, yes, but they do it through human beings, particularly so in a knowledge-based economy. And so we do everything we can do that we need to do to talk to directors and CEOs and executive directors like yourself uh, to really elevate the importance of people in the discussion. We often say people are our most important asset, but we don't actually treat them that way. So that's part of our, our mission and, and what we do every day here at SHARM. Awesome, awesome. Well, I know we have a number of SHARM members who are joining us today. So hey. hearing more not only about the work that you do along with them, but how that work really begins to create opportunities across our communities is critically important. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Um, <laughs> today's conversation is really going to focus a lot on the issues of race and equity uh, in the workplace. Yes. Um, as a black man in this country, you know, we don't have the luxury of pretending that our own history doesn't exist. Um, would you reflect on any memories of your own experiences that weigh on you and challenges that maybe you've had personally or professionally as a black man in this country? Yeah, so it's really interesting. I've I've had I, and I'm the first person to say I've had a wonderful experience in life, okay? Um, and it's had some, some positives and some negatives. I grew up in the deep South. Frankly, as you know, as, as Southern as you can get is Fort Lauderdale, Florida, other than Miami, right? We're at the literal physical bottom of our country, right? And, um, and as, as beautiful as Fort Lauderdale may appear right now, and it's cosmopolitan and it's diverse, when I grew up, that wasn't necessarily the Fort Lauderdale that we know today. My grandfather, for whom the beach in Fort Lauderdale is now, it's called the Dania Beach, it's Mizell Beach, is, 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 it's named after him because he led the Wade Inn, which was an effort to desegregate the Fort Lauderdale beaches. There was a time when you were Black, you were not allowed to go on to the beach, uh, not because no one thought we could swim, but because they didn't want you to swim in that beach, right? That's in my lifetime that my grandfather had to lead the charge. He was a physician and had to lead the charge to make the county diversify. I also went to school in an area of Broward County, a city town called Davie, Florida, where the KKK would march down the streets openly. I'll I remember the day being in the third grade and we were outside at recess and my teacher started grabbing up all of the black children and telling us to go inside. And I was like, for what? And I then only after, you know, I listened and my nosiness was like, what's going on? The KKK was marching and she didn't want us to be exposed to that. Uh, it was a majority uh, institution and there were only a few black children anyway, me being maybe one of three or four in this classroom. But I remembered saying, gosh, they've got to protect me from just being me. I'm at school, like what's this all about? So those were really uh, important moments in my life and, and they inform who I am now and they impacted it and influenced me. Now. When I say I've had a good experience in life, I could have taken those situations and gone negative. I hate all white people and white all white people hate black people. And, and I could have walked away with that. That wasn't my experience. I realized that, and it was because I had some really important people in my life who said that, you know, listen, there are people who are not gonna like you because of your skin color. There are people who are not gonna like you for a number of reasons. But what you've got to do is you've got to be successful in spite of them. Think about it. If your mother works as hard as she does, I have a single mom who's a nurse and she was doing everything she could to put her kids to school. And if you're going to let someone else's bigotry get in the way of your success, then you're dishonoring your mother's hard work. So what we're going to do is be successful in spite of all of this. Has it always been easy? No. Have I had people who discriminated against me on the basis of my race? 
Sure. Um, and should we do something about that? Yes, every day. And some of the work that we do here at SHRM is about doing our best to eradicate, eliminate racism and other forms of bias in the workplace. But at the end of the day, we're all naive if we don't admit that it's been around for a long time, will continue to be around for a long time. And so as a Black man, I think what I can do most effectively is to talk to others who come behind me and say, let's figure out how to get over it, around it, eliminate it to the extent we can, but accept that life is what it is. And it cannot be the reason that we don't enjoy the success that you're owed. That is such a perfect segue into my next question. I think, Johnny, that you would agree that 2020 made one thing clear, <laughs> that race and racism show up in every segment of society, right. definitely including the workplace. And I know that SHRM recently launched the Together Forward, uh, which is a framework for improving workplace cultures for Black, Indigenous, people of color. Um, I'm sure our audience would love to hear more about that Together Forward work. So can you share a little bit about the data uh, that informs that work and the strategies that you are proposing that we can utilize to create and sustain sort of anti-racist workplaces. Well, so it's it's the initiative is called the Together Forward at little at sign work. Uh, so the Together Forward at Work campaign and and listen, it's it, we actually decided to take a slightly different angle. So there are no shortage of organizations out there that were working on racial injustice work, civil rights, police brutality, et cetera. And they were largely, and I like to describe this as they were working on Main Street. And we were Wall Street, right? Countless examples of throughout my relatively short tenure on this earth of, you know, we know Rodney King, Freddie Gray, and it didn't matter who the president was. Freddie Gray was the president and Baltimore burned when President Barack Obama was the president. Like, so we've seen this. And, and this last time with George Floyd, President Donald Trump was president. So like, sadly, we have a problem in America that continues to show up every three to five years. But I'll be, I'll be very honest, historically, and frankly, never in the history that I've been around, did it come to the workplace, right? It was in the streets and you came to work and all we did was we compartmentalized our lives and said, that's what's happening on the outside. And this is what's happening within the four walls of this building. Something different happened in 2020. There was a palpable difference. It jumped right, from Main Street to Wall Street or within the walls of corporations. And so we were forced to address this racial, racial reckoning. And it wasn't just an issue from the outside, it was all of our issue to address. And so Sherm said, how can we be involved? How can we engage in a thoughtful, evidence-based uh, way as opposed to fully, everything has some emotion, but purely emotional decision-making doesn't always yield the best result. So we said, we have a group here of about 30 or so PhDs, uh, statisticians, IO psychologists on staff here at SHRM. And I said, why don't we go figure out what's really going on here? Uh, Listen, if it were, we've been, we've been doing diversity and initiative, diversity initiatives for 30 years, yet here we are, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we still have about four to five percent of the country's lawyers are black. That was the same number 20 years ago. America's medical physicians uh, population is still about three to four percent. Like for all that we've talked about and all of the time and money and energy we put into this, we are still not significantly better off than we were two decades ago. So now's the point to stop and figure out what can we do differently. And that served as the basis for the creation of the Together Forward at Work campaign. Now we understand that there are 20 plus dimensions of diversity, race, gender, national origin, disability status, you can go there. But given what uniquely happened in 2020 and this moment, we were gonna focus exclusively on racial injustice at work. And again, to be clear to anyone listening, that is not to suggest that there are not some really invidious forms of discrimination on other bases, you know, categories and, and, and uh, demographic differences that need to be addressed. But we said, let's do this. And if we get this framework right, 
then it will apply to other forms of discrimination as we go. So we focused on racial injustice and we said fundamental in our research and we talked to employees all over the country, we said, what's at the core here? And I'm gonna share with you something that was fascinating. We learned that everyone has an opinion about this, but you're not supposed to talk about it at work. <laughs> That was the biggest aha, is it was the dirtiest reality that no one would talk about. And if you think about it, if you're a day over 35 years old, and I think you're barely, and so am I, we're kind of, you know, after, we're older, older, over 40, let's call it that, right? Um, we were socialized that there were three things you didn't talk about at work. There's a dinner table and there's a lunch table. And the two did not cross. There were some conversations you didn't talk about. And they really fell into three categories, religion, race, and politics. You just didn't talk about those things at work. They were non-starters. And so for 20 or 30 years, we were doing all of this diversity work, but we didn't want to talk about it. We just didn't. It was the CEO and senior management's responsibility to ensure that you had a more diverse workplace, but we weren't going to talk about it at work. Let's talk about work at work. And you talk about this other stuff on your own time. And the reality is you spend most of the time outside of work with people who look like you and have shared experiences. So you were preaching to the converted when you did have conversations around race. And so now you come to work and as diverse as the workplace is, we have an inclusion problem because none of us have actually addressed those conversations outside of our own communities. And so we said, and this was fundamental to our creation of the Together Forward, Work at Camp, to Together Forward at Work campaign, is that we were going to encourage people to have, to get uncomfortable for a minute. And that at work, it was okay to talk about racial justice issues. It was okay to have convenings where non-Black employees really began to understand through empathy what my experience every day is as a Black man or you as a Black woman, because they, frankly, let's be honest, they had no reason to know that. Why would they, right? We told them not to talk about it at work. And on our part-time outside of work, I didn't spend time with people like, so there you go. So it was really important to use this interesting workplace where I have you for eight to 10 hours a day, captive audience, Right. And I can begin to over in, in the right way with guardrails around it, we could have honest conversations about race. That's at the core of it. And then we used a ton of, we developed a toolkit. And I'm going to stop talking about it because I'm so excited about this work. We developed a toolkit to put guardrails around those conversations because you and I both know uh, put a whole bunch of people in a room and start taking on something fairly controversial, it can get ugly. And so mm -hmm. it can be counterproductive in the end. Our goal was for these to be productive. So have really uncomfortable conversations with appropriate guardrails with the hope of us identifying how much we have in common versus focusing on our differences. And we're gonna to get to the differences and we're gonna to learn to all work together, but focusing on commonality. So it's really interesting that you would lift up this notion of how we create spaces within our workplaces to have these oftentimes tough, yes. yet important conversations. So um, for our listeners, Johnny, can you give us a sense of sort of how we create that space sort of how we create those guardrails and how we lift up the opportunities for people to feel comfortable that they can really move into these conversations without feeling guilted, without right. feeling like you've got to show up for as a black person, every other black person in the country to speak your <laughs> truth on their behalf. Let's right. talk about what that looks like and how that feels in the workplace. Oh my gosh, you, we're gonna have a good time in this conversation because it is so true, right? Uh, so you start with, and number one, you must have true senior management alignment and commitment to this work. Mm. All of the organizations, I'm talking CEO, executive director, president, whatever, if it doesn't start at the top and it's not a shared cultural commitment, amongst everyone in the, uh, the, the executive suite, it will fail. I can assure you, this cannot be driven uh, by an employee who thinks this is a big issue. Uh, it can't be driven by just a chief diversity officer. It's, it's mind numbing, the number of people who think they can go out, hire a chief diversity officer that solves for the problem. It doesn't. This has to start from absolute senior management buy-in. And by the way, this isn't just about diversity. This is an every 
facet of business. If the executive team doesn't buy into the strategy and the direction, then it is likely to fail. So we've got to address this as we do everything else. Once you've gotten that and these conversations, you do, it then comes down to culture. And what do I mean by culture? You have got to convince your employees that you mean this, and that's why senior management is so important, and that, in fact, there are no negative consequences to having these conversations. Many of us know the downsides to doing that, right? We've been taught that over years, that if you go down that pathway, it's either what we call a CEM or a CLM. A CLM is a career limiting move and a CEM is a career ending move. And so we've been taught over time that having these conversations at work can absolutely significantly change the trajectory of your career. So people are not likely to want to have them unless they trust that senior management says, we actually want you to have them. So senior management buy-in and then senior management has to communicate constantly to employees. We are welcoming these conversations. More than just welcoming them and embracing them, we're demanding them. We expect you to have these conversations. Now, the third step is the most important part, and this is where HR, working with line managers and diversity officers, et cetera, we've got to put guardrails on them because you said the most important thing. These are uncomfortable conversations. And by the way, they're going to be uncomfortable for everyone. They're going to be uncomfortable for the white man in that room. They're going to be uncomfortable for the black woman in that room. These are uncomfortable. And so we lead with empathy. Empathy says you don't come in a room to have a debate because in a debate, you're not listening to understand. You're listening to counter, to respond. And mm -hmm. that, that doesn't work. A discussion versus a debate is the first number one rule that we set up. Anyone who comes in and says they want to debate, uh, uh, you know, that means I gotta be right and you have to be wrong, means we, this is counterproductive. So number one. Number two, we have to set the ground rules of civility and respect. We can confront without being confrontational, we can agree without being disagreeable, and you say to employees right away, you might lose your job if you are disrespectful and uncivil because our goal as an organization is to make everyone's voice be heard, yours and theirs. And so coming into a safe space where it's only safe for part of the people in the room and it's really damn unsafe for the other people is a bad idea. And again, counterproductive. So we set up rules of engagement. And I've said to some employees, I have one particular employee who's really, and I don't judge them because I'm understanding I, I, I can't walk in their shoes, but this empathy says this person's father was killed by a white man. And so he has a lot of anger and, you know, and I said, you probably shouldn't come to this conversation because this is not going to be good. And you're going to end up taking this out on everyone. And there's going to be a chilling effect on the conversation. And then it's pointless. Again, why even convene this right now? So we may have individual interactions and interventions with that person to help them. So you got to figure out, so guardrails. And then finally, uh, and this is the most important of everything that I've said, this stuff didn't happen overnight and it's not going to be resolved overnight. So any of these organizations that believe they're going to bring in a consultant for a few weeks and we're going to have a few sessions and we're going to be woke all of a sudden, and we're, they're just naive. This is hard work. Human beings have a true immunity to change, right? And if you are, you've been raised a certain way, be you Black, white, Latino, straight, gay, whatever you are, whatever biases we all bring to our, our existence, right? If you think they're going to change after a quick intervention, three or four visits, you're wrong. And so organizations have to commit to a long-term transformation a commitment to do this work for a sustained period of time. When you do that, we won't be here a decade from now. But for the people who want to go out and do these spot things and see instant results, they're going to be frustrated because it doesn't work that way. Yeah, that phenomena of listening to hear and not to respond, hard. I think hard. is sometimes where people just get caught up. That's right. So, you know, that that's just um, a, a, a great way to not only frame these sorts of conversations, but so many other conversations that we have in the course of our lives, listening to hear 
and not to respond. And can I tell you, it's really funny. So I had a, and this is not an apologist, it's not a defender or anything, but I had a couple of instances where people had some really negative experiences with people who looked like me. And we were in a session and we, and I actually had to give them the safe space. See, safe space isn't just one way. Safe means safe for everyone in the room. And so Mm -hmm. in this particular session, an employee opened up and shared how he ended up developing a perception of black men, white male. And you're right. Even me, you know, I'm, I'm trained in this work. I'm supposed to be above this all. As he began to naturally in his communication style, make judgments and make um, generalizations and stereotypes, I was getting really pissed. I was listening, but I wanted to respond to everything that he said. When he'd say, you know, <laughs> when black people do this, I want to say, oh, I'm one of 40 million black people. Not, you know, there's not a black person, right? Who represents us all to your earlier point. But I had to, train myself to say, Johnny, just as I want him to listen and understand my experience as a Black man, I've got to understand and listen to his. And that is really hard for us, for us. And that's why we root this entire body of work in empathy. It is the only way it works. We can go out and have all the training we want, for example, around sexual harassment. Okay, we've done it for 20 or 30 years, yet people still sexual harass people in the workplace. So laws and training aren't going to solve the problem. At its core, we've got to appeal to people's minds and their hearts. And that's what empathy can, we can actually make change if we can get to people's minds and their hearts. I love that about empathy. Um, It is so important, but I'm going to transition from empathy Mm -hmm. to being woke. Okay. (laughs) Well, let's talk about it. Yeah, let's just break it down here. So I'm going to go to a piece of data that I lifted up from the Together Forward finding. Yes. And it shows a significant gap in the beliefs between black and white HR professionals. Yes. So 49% of black HR professionals feel discrimination based on race or ethnicity in the workplace. While only 13% of whites believe that same thing. And overall, 21% agree. So let's talk about how we sort of define this space, but how we think about the disconnect that's really happening in our workplaces today. That is brilliant. Of all of our research findings, that's the one that stood stands out the most to me. That to your point, there's this huge disconnect uh, with respect to how, not only how black employees and white employees experience work, but how HR professionals observe those experiences at work. And that's scary. And that was a real call out for us as a profession. When you have that much of a disconnect in the workplace, that means there's a problem, right? And so you you nailed the crux of the issue. And that's why we decided to focus on conversations because the reality, and I want you to follow me here. If white people spend all of their time outside of work with white people, And then when they come to work, you're working in your individual kind of capacities and you go to lunch and we all naturally kind of gravitate with people who look like us. So they go to lunch with white people and we go to lunch with black people, right? That's what we do. Let's be honest, right? I remember I tell this story when I was at Drake and I go into the lunchroom or cafeteria, dining room, whatever they call it now. And uh, it was funny. You had this room, I could sit anywhere I, I wanted to sit, but I naturally gravitated to the black folks table and the white people naturally gravitated to their table. And so although we were on this diverse campus and you could sit anywhere, unlike my great grandparents, my grandparents, I actually could sit anywhere I wanted. I chose to gravitate toward people with whom I had a common. So that's what happens, right? So what we've said in core to answer the question, we've said that the only way this works is if we have those white HR professionals come in and actually engage meaningfully, not superficially, meaningfully with other HR, black HR executives and, and, and professionals. And so as they began to talk, and we've actually been convening these sessions, you find the light bulb that goes off with the white HR professional said, you know, I never thought about that. I never did. And then, and similarly, you'd have those moments, and I, I gotta give you just a quick anecdote, 
So we brought some black and white professionals together to probe this very question, we understand what's going on here. And so right after the George Floyd murder, okay, May 25th last year, so the first or so week of June, everyone's trying to do the right thing, white and black. We're just trying to figure this all out. And so the white HR professionals were torn. Do I go to black employees and say, I'm here to help? What can I do for you? White woman said in this session, I did that. And this black guy went, ate me up alive and said, what makes you think I need your help? What makes I think I need your sympathy? Blah, 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 blah. And she says, I was just terrified. And she said, so we decided stand down. But then you had other black employees sitting there and black HR colleagues who said, what's the organization doing? How are you not convening employees? Why aren't you responding to your black employees concerns. And so right there, they weren't talking. So the white employee walked away and said, you know what, there's no problem. The black people don't want us to address this. The black HR professionals are saying, where the hell are you? Why aren't you stepping up? And that was a, but we had a breakthrough moment in that conversation. We're not talking. That, that's the, the real issue here is even amongst the HR profession, we are not talking. We're experiencing race. We're all in the same place, but having very different experiences. And that again is at the core of the Together Forward at Work initiative is to get us together to begin to understand what the other person is thinking, experiencing, observing. So it's interesting when I sort of take that concept to sort of the reality of Iowa. Yes. <laughs> and the fact that we are very much a white state. That's right. Um, let's talk about how we begin to think about increasing the pool of minority candidates. Yes. That we have the ability to attract to the amazing corporations that reside right here in DSM USA. Yes. But even yes. beyond that, Johnny, let's talk about this notion of not only attracting and hiring that talent, but what it looks like to retain, promote, yeah. and sustain those efforts. Yeah, my gosh, that's the, I, I spent seven and a half years at the Thurgood Marshall College Fund, uh, which represents the country's public that is state supported historically black colleges and universities. And I can't tell you the number of times people from the principal and from Meredith and major employees. Wells Fargo had a significant presence there through Norwest. And they would come to us and say, listen, I want to do something about the lack of diversity in my workplace in the state of Iowa, particularly in the DSM. I love that I hadn't used that in a while, DSM of the USA. And we, they would come to us literally saying, "Give, what do you need to help us attract talent? And I said, your number one problem is Blacks predominantly, not all of them, but live in major metropolitan markets. So it's going to be hard to get Johnny Taylor from Fort Lauderdale to consider the best opportunity in Des Moines, Iowa. One, because you are the whitest state. And so because we all naturally want, a, we feel safety in numbers, there are too few numbers. So I'm going to go out here and be alone. I remember when I first moved to Des Moines, the hell I caught trying to find a place to get hair products. <laughs> it was so simple, something as simple as that. And you ask, what can an employer do about that per se, right? Ship my stuff in for me, maybe do what you gotta do, right? But, but the idea is in terms of recruitment, companies have to be very intentional about going to communities and saying, we want you here. This, we will help you. We've, when you get here, we're going to have a welcome party. We're going to introduce you to the churches. We're going to show you where to get your hair done. We're going to show you. There is a role that companies in states like Iowa, employers, I should say, not just companies, for profit, for profit, nonprofit, but you've got to do more than just say we have opportunities available. You've actually got to go that extra step that when a candidate comes, you've got to show them that this is going to be a place you want to live. Because remember, you only spend eight to 10 hours a day at work. The rest of that time, you got to live in this community. So number one is in the recruitment process. It's very much about uh, it's just assimilation, telling them how would it feel once you get here. Then your point is retention. And this is a dilemma for employers. 
So the person goes, they're recruited to name it, the principal, and they do really, really well. And because you're in smaller numbers, the entire country is looking for that very successful, tried and proven and tested African-American. So they pull them away from you, right? Apple will let you hire them into your technology group prove that they're great, and then hire them away to California, New York, Atlanta, name it. And so you're constantly fighting with a limited supply of talent, Black talent. It's not limited because we lack talent. And I know that happened. The, the Wells Fargo guys <laughs> made some crazy statement about you can't find them. But the fact of the matter is, we're only 12, 13% of the US population. So no matter what, you're not gonna have the same available talent pool as the majority population. Let's just be honest, right? So what we've got to do then is you've got to be especially focused on making sure that your compensation is strong, as strong as it can be. And it might be really above market, just a real tactic as an HR guy, this is a little geeky. But I remember sitting down with the CEO of a company who said, I want this guy, African-American, I want him to come into our organization. But Johnny, when I look across the table from an equity standpoint, internal equity, I can't bring him in that much higher of a salary than the rest of the team. And I said, why not? And there was this pause. I said, the more rare something is, the more we pay for it. It's not my fault that African-Americans are more rare. <laughs> I said, it is what it is. The market is what it takes to get someone. Period. That's what the market is. So I hear you, but I, you know, if, if you're serious about this, then you got to do something about it. And if otherwise, your excuse will always be that you can't find that talent. So compensation is a big part. I've already talked about recruiting and making people feel good and, and welcome. So the inclusion part. But at the end of the day, most of us go to work to make money. And most of us need to make as much money as we can for as long as we're able to work, right? It is what it is. That's the American dream I can buy and take care of my family and all of that. So you've got to make sure that your compensation is uber competitive. And I'm not talking necessarily internally competitive. I'm just saying competitive. When you, when a, a, can you imagine a coach of a professional basketball team, say it, saying, you know, I want Kobe, but Kobe, you know, I can't pay you more than the other four people on the team when Kobe was alive or, or Michael Jordan or name the person. He's like, no, no, no. It's not about equality. It's about equity. And you pay for the talent that you want. And if you go to those people and explain to them that this is what it is. So I, it's a really controversial. And I wanted to answer this and tackle it right on. Typically, and I've heard this repeatedly as an HR executive, as a consultant, as a lawyer, I want the person, but I can't afford to pay them. And I said, well, then that means you don't want them. Mm -hmm. That's what it means. Because mm -hmm. we pay for what we want. <laughs> you know, it is what right. it is. Right, right. So I'm a proud HBCU graduate, Spelman College, class All of 1978. Right. <laughs> um, and, you know, wait a I minute, know you can't say 78. I just told you you're a little over 35, oh, come on, okay. 98, 98, <laughs> own it, own it. <laughs> Gray hairs to prove it. Um, but I do think that, you know, this notion of the emergence of HBCUs, especially with the um, election of our first African-American uh, female uh, vice president, Kamala Harris, who's a proud Howard Bison graduate. Yes, you know, yes. I, I just do think that there are opportunities to sort of tap in to those HBCUs in ways that I think create opportunities for talent enhancement, attraction development. But I think the other thing, and I'm gonna to go to something that you spoke to, there are so many rich resources in our communities of color that sometimes we miss lifting up. Yes. You know, the presence in Des Moines of the Divine Nine and yes. every group represented, the Lynx Incorporated, you know, Sigma Pi Phi, all of these amazing organizations. And you know, it would be great for us just to maybe think about doing a, a video focused on not only the depth of diversity that exists in our communities, but how these people show up, That's why right. they came here, why they stayed. And I think that would be just so powerful in sharing the message of why Des Moines and why now. Well, so you, you nailed it. I remembered when I came to Des Moines uh, to visit the law school and, and they sold me on, you know, great legal education, you'll get a good job, da, 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 da. What they didn't do as effectively, to your point, is introduce me to, I'm a Kappa, of course, Kappa F side in the room. Uh, you didn't take me and say, 
the divine nine has a real presence here. I know you've only heard about, you know, Iowa have one or 2% black population, but there are a lot of them right here in Des Moines, okay? So here they are. They didn't do those things to show me who the leaders, that there was a vibrant community uh, that I could become a part of, and I would be able to, you know, feel welcomed. And, and, and that is our opportunity. So it's interesting that you raise that because there are a lot of things that employers can do. And there are a lot of things that people like me and you and your colleagues in Des Moines can and must do. To your point, give us a video to show us about the assets in the DSM that would make us attractive to some kid who's right now very talented in Atlanta. You're competing with a lot, right? I'm, gonna, mm -hmm. I'm black, I'm, I'm, in, I'm 25, and I'm going to leave Atlanta to come to Des Moines. Good luck. So we also, as a community, share some responsibility in talking about why people should consider Des Moines. So I, I love that, and I would love to see your group um, come up with that, because that's a part of the cell. Yeah, yeah, so true, so true. So I'm gonna maybe center us a little bit on some of the reality that we know exists right here, right now. Mm -hmm. So um, pre-COVID, the unemployment rate for blacks um, in the state of Iowa was 10.3% as compared to a statewide unemployment rate of about 2.8%. Right. And we know the disproportionate impact of COVID on communities of color. Yes. So if you wouldn't mind, can you talk a little bit about systems and policies and practices that need to be addressed in order to level the playing field for Blacks who are not only interested in moving into employment opportunities, but are primed to fill some of these jobs that um, are needed and necessary but for whatever reason, we feel like we can't find quality candidates to fill those jobs. Three quick responses. One, and this is the one that I am so passionate about, is we have got to, from a system standpoint, address the K through 12 system and the loss of learning over the last year and a half. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally. We know that public schools are disproportionately in this country. They are majority minority. When you look at K through 12 public systems, public school systems across the country, they are majority minority. So this period of time when public schools have taken kids who are already uh, likely a little bit behind their uh, counterparts, and we took them out of face-to-face -face education. And while some education occurred, it was suboptimal. I'm on a charter school board and I can tell you, those kids simply did not learn as well as their counterparts. My daughter is in private school here in DC and they went to school every day in person. And of course, she's one of a few minority children in her class, but I know what her cousins and sisters and brothers, the loss of learning that occurred over this last year and a half. I'm concerned about that as an African-American because it's disproportionately black and brown, but I'm also concerned about it as the CEO of SHRM because as our country is undoubtedly going to be more diverse, that means the workforce of the future will be more diverse. And I have a smaller pool already to start with, and now it's compromised because they didn't get high quality education during this period of time. So number one is from a system standpoint, if we want not to look back 20 years from now and say, oh gosh, it's not 4% black lawyers in the country, it's two and a half percent because we lost so much ground in the pipeline. That is something we all have got to figure out how to catch up these kids who lost learning over the last year and a half. Fundamentally, that is so core. People talk about the biggest issues of our time. That's it. We all know that education is the great equalizer. And we have had an, literally, we have, I'm feel very passionate if you can't tell about this, because this is going to be ugly. We're not thinking about the long-term impacts of this 10 years from now, when that kid who's right now in the fourth grade didn't get a high quality education for two years. Those are fundamental developmental years. So that's it. Secondly, for, we know that the service industry was disproportionately impacted by COVID and that that is disproportionately black and brown. You don't have to go very far to see even the jobs that used to be at McDonald's. McDonald's figured out how to 
reduced the number of people working in their store during COVID because they've now embraced technology. You go in, and I don't know if it's happening in Iowa, but in D.C., hell, where there were 10 people taking orders, there are now two people and eight machines, right? It's just a different world. So that is going to further exacerbate this 10 point 3% unemployment rate, if I got the number right, in Iowa, many of those jobs, those service jobs, even go to the grocery store. Now you got the self-checkout lane. So I don't need as many people working there. And that will impact our community, which means we've got to do a much better job, a much better job on reskilling. The country, the state, our communities have to double down because people think these jobs are coming back because the economy is reopening. The fact of the matter is other jobs are going to happen. Higher skill jobs will open, but not the ones that we were doing before. And that will hurt us. So a significant reskilling and upskilling initiative focused on people who've been displaced, who, to you, as you said, already are disproportionately Black in the state of Iowa. So that's it. And then finally, and it's the biggest thing that, that I think we've got to do is we have a birth rate problem. Americans had fewer children. And they really slowed down having children during the pandemic. The data is there, okay? So we're going to have to, and this will put a smile on your face and mine, we're going to have to stop looking at the younger generation as the source of the future workforce. We're going to have to retool middle-aged Americans. We're going to have to look at that 45-year-old and say, we've got to ensure that you don't just get to 65. We need you potentially working until 70 because the pipeline is just, we didn't have babies for the last Two decades since the year 2000, the American birth rate has been on a decline. And that means we, we just don't have enough bodies to do what we're going to do, right? And so what I think we can do, especially for Blacks and who, who were able to succeed into middle management, we're going to have to retool them for the jobs of the future because we need them. This isn't just altruism or civil rights or whatever, we actually as employers need this talent. There are not, as I jokingly say, if every American capable, of, capable of, of having a child right now went home tonight and had a kid, that kid won't be able to come to work for us for another 18 years and perhaps 22 after college. So mm -hmm. this is a long-term problem that we've got to address today. And you do it by not waving off 45 and 50 year olds. Employers are gonna to have to invest right now in that 55 year old employee, because you might be able to get 15 years out of that person if you reskill them. I love that sort of rethinking that paradigm relative to sort of those mid-level managers, but also those people who are in that age range who are typically looking to transition out, reinvesting in them in ways that extend their, the likelihood that they will stay with you and help to sort of bridge that gap. That's right. Wow, I, I'd not heard that before. So I'm enlightened today, Johnny. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And hey, listen, so, the, the closer you get to 50, the younger 60 looks, right? <laughs> so those young people, you know, the 55 year olds. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So um, we're getting close to our time, but I'm gonna just maybe um, touch on a couple of topics that Real I quick. think are important around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yes. So commitments to you know, those efforts are about people and culture. Yes. Um, it's not just about checking a box. <laughs> uh, right. It's not just about sort of one and done. That's right. It's about a sustained effort over time that really at the end of the day goes to the core of your brand That's right. as an organization. So can you share some examples of organizations that have successfully embedded DEI strategies, training, education, who are just knocking it out of the park that can become real true examples for what corporations should aspire to when they think about this whole notion of DEI and how it shows up in the workplace. So can I be honest? I don't know of an exemplar. Okay. I don't. And, and, and I have the advantage, the vantage point of 300,000 members across the globe. Now there are, prop, there are a lot of companies that are small and medium sized companies who are probably nailing, and I just don't know. But of the major you know, Fortune 500, the ones that brands that you would know, if I named some company in you know, some town in, and you may or may not know them, but to be honest, very few, I don't know of anyone who's figured this out. Why? Because A, it's complicated. 
and, and the solutions are nuanced, but also because there are multiple layers. So you have some organizations who have figured out how to deal with the base of their triangle. They bring in a very diverse workforce, and then it becomes very white and very male very quickly, right? So they solve for bringing people in, but they can't seem to promote them. And then you find organizations that can get them to you know, out of the base and into mid-level management and they Peter principle very quickly. Like once you get there, okay, I'm the manager of this and I stay in that role for 15 or 20 years, okay? Then you have organizations who can get you to the top, but their boards aren't diverse, right? And that's the other problem is, you know, it's amazing to me when I hear there are 500 companies in the Fortune 500. The fact that every one of them does not have one black says to me that in a country of 40 million people, you can't find 500 people, one a piece for each of the Fortune 500. So you're not going to tell me that company that says, oh, we've got it figured out. Not, no, no, no. I wouldn't care how well you're doing at the base. I don't yeah. see it at the top. And as I said, if you hearken back to my earlier comments, this only works if it starts at the top. And it's more than just, it has to be, if you talk about it being a cultural truth and not just a program, a diversity and equity and initiative program, but it really is the way we do business. It's a part of our culture. Then don't tell me you love me, show me you love me. Like I have to see it. And I don't know of an organization that has truly figured it out from the top all the way to the entry level of the organization. I, I haven't, I don't know any that are doing that well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm being transparent. So, but. No, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I, I, I would also venture to say that probably one of the fastest growing segments of sort of the HR professional world are these DEI officers, That's people right. who are assuming these roles in organizations. It is. How are you seeing that emerge, not only in the work that Sherm is doing, but also in terms of how that shows up uh, in companies and also around the work that companies need to be doing as they're thinking about sort of moving into this space. So I love that. And I'm going to try and give you a real tight answer to that. I'm excited, I tell you on one hand, because it is encouraging that companies are actually bringing in people who are experts at this and not just the person who didn't make it in another part of the company or who happens to fit the demographic that they're trying to message to the world their employer brand is because you know the story uh you know all of the de and i people are black you know it's like come on stop it like i want you and i hope they are but i mean the point being we should look more for people who are really qualified i say this all the time and at first it fell kind of flat with people i'm an african-american executive i'm not a de and i executive and so what happens in a lot of organizations is they know they need to do something. So they go out and they find a high performing black executive and they say, we want you to be the head of DEI. I said, but I'm no expert at DEI. I'm a lawyer, right? That's I'm a CEO. Like I'm not a DEI expert. Go find people who do this really, really well. Give them the resources to do it and the commitment from the organization from the top. And then we will see this work come about. I am concerned that we have a lot of window dressing hiring going on right now when it comes mm -hmm. to DEI. So there's no shortage. You're right. It's it's on fire. If one more search firm calls me, this company wants a DEI person and we'd love you to do it. I said, well, that means you didn't research me well. It's like this company wanted a head of technology and you called me. Hell, I don't have a technology background. So why are you calling me? And, and that I'm seeing a lot of that is we are mm -hmm. rushing out to check the box, as you said, yeah. and that actually can do more damage than good because we already, we have a moment, a moment in history where people are actually, I think corporate America genuinely wants to do something about DE&I. And if we serve up less than qualified, less than high quality and experienced executives, and they go in and screw it up, they'll say, I told you so, and then they'll give up. So I, I do caution us all that quality over quantity, finding those executives who have a passion for the work, but also who have the skills to do the work strategically, not just program check boxes, if we do that well, then it's going to be a great world and a country for us to be in 10 years from now. If we don't, and we simply, you know, rush out to do what is expedient, uh, then we're going to pay dearly for it. 
I appreciated something you said earlier about the notion of this work really needing to be embedded at the C-suite le level. Yes. And the um, commitment and the courageous leadership of corporate CEOs to really get this and get yes. it right. Get it right. It's critically important to the long-term success and sustainability um, of the effort. So again, it's not a one and done. Nope. It's really about finding the right talent at the right time with the right fit. And you named it, finding the right talent. That CDO, that Chief Diversity Officer role. And I've said this to recently, two Fortune 100 CEOs. It is, this is your most important hire, not your chief commercial officer, not your general counsel, not even your CHRO. The most important job that you have got to get right for me as an African-American talking to a non-African-American CEO, chief executive, is to, if you're going to hire a chief diversity officer, that you hire the absolute best one, scour the earth and get the person who can ensure success within your organization because you bring the wrong person in. There are a whole bunch of people sitting on the sidelines saying, this isn't going to work. It's never worked and it's not going to work. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I don't want to waste this moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, truly, that's how you take the moment to the movement. They, men, Getting it men. right from the beginning is critical to yes. being able to do that. Johnny, we've covered a lot of territory. Yes, we and, have. Um, I want to leave you with the last word, but to sort of frame out that last word, I'm going to Take us back to where we started this conversation as we shared the video with our audience about the Together at Work Forward. And um, you talk about many hands. Yes. And you talk about how those hands collectively uh, can make a difference. So I'm gonna allow you to take us uh, from this conversation to your final message to the audience about why those many hands are critical, uh, critical now, and what that looks like moving forward as those hands join together uh, to make our communities, our work cultures, and um, our places of employment much stronger. Yeah, the last major movement that our country experienced was the civil rights movement. That really, it was more than a fad. It was even more than a movement. It, it ultimately became transformational for our country. And I think we have this very unique moment in time right now to take this to the next level. But no one community can do this alone. This is not the white man's problem. It's not the black community's problem. It's not, you know, we have all, we need all of these hands, black, white, brown, male, female. We need allies as well as people who are activists. I mean, you need all of these hands to shape a, 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 a more perfect union. And that's what we're all pursuing. That's what Together Forward at Work Initiative is all about. Uh, it is forcing us, because I don't think you can, it's forcing us to have conversations to start the work. If people aren't talking and they're not having some uncomfortable conversations, then we will never, ever, ever reach that promised land that Martin Luther King and others spoke about because we just won't have reason to. We will each, we're very tribalistic and everyone's gonna go back to their corners and point at why the other person is failing and we won't make any progress. So my hope is that all of us stop and realize that we are Americans at our core and it's gonna take all of us, all of our hands to, to make us uh, realize the dreams that we all deserve and our children and our grandchildren deserve. So thank you all so much, God bless you. Thank you for having me here. And I'm so glad to be back home in Iowa. Johnny, it's a thrill to welcome you back. Um, thank you so much for sharing not only your words, but also your wisdom and your work with us. Um, it's been a pleasure for me to not only spend this time with you, but to also be able to share not only your amazing work at SHRM, but you as a person with the Des Moines community yet again. Yes, so thank yes. you for being with us. Um, hopefully we'll have a chance to do this again and continue yes. the good work at SHRM. We really appreciate it. it. God bless you, be well. Take care, bye-bye. I think you will agree that Johnny Taylor was not only engaging, uh, but truly insightful and brought us some great, great information. So I'm hoping that you had some good takeaways as a result of today's conversation with Johnny C. Taylor, President and CEO of the Society for Human Resource Management. So I'm gonna give you a little teaser about our upcoming June conversation. Uh, we are excited to be able to announce that 
We are finalizing our conversations with Joyce Hannabady, who is representing the third district of Ohio. She is chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. And I don't know if you all are MSNBC watchers, but she has been featured over the course of the last several months in a variety of different capacities. And I believe that Joyce will be a great speaker to not only share with us information about what's happening um, in Washington, DC, but also other things that are critical to national policy as it relates to the issues of economic equity and uh, justice. So thanks for joining us for our April Conversations in Color. Hopefully you'll be able to join us in June. Uh, thanks again to our sponsor, the ITA Group, and our host, the Greater Des Moines Partnership. See you in June. Thanks for joining us.